Hello, my friends. Buckle up. I'm going to ask you a question. With raised hands, you can answer in reply. How many are looking forward to Christ's coming, the King of Kings return to begin the thousand year rule and reign with his beloved? How many? Let's see a raise of hands. <sighs> now, here we go. Certain things must come to pass before your heart's cry can come to pass. I've labored, labored over this teaching for some time because it needs to be taught. I'll leave it at that for now. In Acts 3.21, it says that the heavens must hold Jesus back, retain him until a time of restitution spoken of all, uh, regarding all things spoken of by God's holy prophets since the beginning of time. In other words, Jesus cannot come back until the words that were declared about him are complete. There are some things standing between you and I and, and the Lord's return that have to come to pass. And as a teacher, I would be at odds if I did not share these things with you. Now, you're going to have an opportunity to receive or deny them or put them on a shelf, and I look forward to you studying to show yourself approved, a workman who un is not ashamed, a workman unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. I I'm looking forward to this, and I hope that you take this with that understanding. Scripture says, receive all things with the readiness of mind, and then search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. One of the finest scriptures that deal with the Lord's return happened when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. He would just shown them the temple and he had communicated to them that not one stone would be upon another. And now they go up to the Mount of Olives and he communicates with them when they ask, what shall these things be and what shall the sign of your coming be? This is called Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Now, bear with me. I'm going to read a chunk of scripture for you and look at the highlighted areas because I'm going to come back and talk about those because those deal with some of the prophecies I want to share with you. But Jesus cannot come back for his bride until key prophecies are fulfilled. <laughs> I want to spend just a very brief amount of time talking with you about the month of Av. I've called ourselves the Avengers for the kingdom. Fifth month in the Hebrew calendar, heading into ultimately the Feast of Tabernacles celebration. Whoa, good stuff. Insights of the past, current insights and future insights will have a great deal to do with the Lord's return and our willingness to understand these words and pay heed to them. The month of Av is a time uh, for decisions of the past find their way into judgments and blessings. I'm going to brief, this is a brief hit on the, on the month of Av because this is going to be my springboard into this teaching. As we have heard, Av refers to Abba, Father. It's the time of the Father. It is also in the constellations we find in Genesis. The, the Bible talks about the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all these different things are uh, for, for times and seasons. So as we understand the things that are in the stars, we can understand and comprehend God's message to us, not only for that season, but that season and beyond. The constellation is the constellation of Leo, and that's where we get the roar of the lion. This is the time frame where the lion roars in the month of Av and beyond, but we need to understand the 
wonderful things that are tied to this, but also the Bible talks about the devil as a roaring lion goes to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. So you're going to hear in this time frame and beyond, you're going to hear the lion's roar, but you're also going to hear the fake lion's roar. We have to understand which roar is the roar for us. And as we do, we are going to break forth roaring as well. In Joel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, And the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people. The Lord will be a refuge for his people during these roarings. He will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. In Amos 3, 7, and 8, it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does not do anything without revealing this, his plan to his servants, the prophets. So get ready for revelation from the roaring lion. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken. And who can but prophesy? In other words, when you're listening and he roars, your obligation is to prophesy the things that he roars. And how important it is to understand the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah versus, versus the lion who's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you're proclaiming the other roar, you're aligning with the wrong side and you can cause much, much damage. So it's our obligation to understand that roar and move forward in what he says to us and roar it forth as well. In Israel, there's an interesting custom in the month of Av, and this is a good thing. This is a blessing thing. On uh, the 15th of Av, the single women went out to the vineyards and they danced in the vineyards, and they were wearing linens that were borrowed from other people. That was so that everybody wore the same caliber of clothing so that somebody goes, oh, I like the way she's dressed. They were all dressed the same way. So you were paying your attention to the person within the linen garments rather than the garments themselves. And the single men, <laughs> oh, they would go out into those vineyards and they would identify the woman that they thought would be a great bride. And the women would go, he looks like a good bridegroom. And that would be the beginning of the romance for a wedding time. I'll tell you what, the single women look forward to it and the single men look forward to it greatly. The month of Elul is when the king comes into the field, by the way. This was also a sad time, and we need to deal with these sad times because the judgments tied to these sad times are part of the prophecies that are coming to pass now. The ten spies said, no, we're not able to take the land, while the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, yes, we are well able. But they had to defer to the ten. Sad. Cost them another 40 years in the wilderness, by the way. The first temple was destroyed at 587 B.C. The second temple was also destroyed in 70 A.D. on the ninth of Av, as happened with the, tri with, the, with the spies giving the bad report. The ninth of Av. The Romans crushed the Jewish revolt in Judea in 135 A.D. 500,000 Jews were killed in that ordeal on the ninth of Av. Coming to current times in August of 2005, a peace treaty was in negotiation and the leaders in the government of Israel were convinced that if they traded land for peace, it would be a good gesture. Well, they gave away Gaza and the Gaza Strip. And instead of peace, they were pummeled with rockets from Gaza and Hamas, who took control of the area. Hamas is a terrorist group, an Islamic terrorist terrorist group alive and well today. The ninth of Av. So we're into a sober month. A month where you understand that things have happened 
and we need to be aware of our lion's roar so we can function appropriately. Now to learn from the warnings implied in of perhaps the clearest single scripture which details this and forewarns us of things to come is where I talked about earlier in the Olivet Discourse. I'm going to read that to you from Matthew 24, 3 through 29. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, yet the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up to tribulation, and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and will betray one another, and they will hate one another, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because the lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation, by the way, they're different sides of the same coin. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let them understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of their house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe unto those who are pregnant and are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved, but in the elect's sake, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive all those, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. If they say, look, he is in the desert, go not out out to see him or look for him for he is in the inner room do not believe it for as the lightning comes from the east to the west so also so shall the coming of the son of man be for whosoever wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And he will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And I'm going to spend a few moments of time in this teaching 
discovering what those mean with you. Thank you. To summarize the prophecies that you just heard, many of them, especially the ones I emboldened, is emboldened are prophecies that must come be to pass between our raising of our hands saying, yes, we want the bridegroom to come and to rule and reign with us for a thousand years. Between now and then, these things must come to pass. Now, in the past, when you've heard, you've heard this, these scriptures before, and in the past, years ago, decades ago, we go, okay, in the future, way down there, maybe four or five generations, uh, this is going to come to pass, and I'll worry about it when it happens. But the things are happening these days at such a frequent rate of intensity we might want to rethink those things. It's a somber, sober thought, but I'm going to share with you some things that are coming to pass even now. When I say now, I'm not saying uh, the past decade. I'm saying a day or two ago, a month or two ago, a year or two ago. That's why this is such a a challenging teaching to teach. But if, I, but if I violated this and did not communicate this to you, I would be at fault. Now, it's your responsibility to hear what I'm saying. Weigh and pray and receive all things with readiness of mind and then search the scriptures daily, see if these things are so. But also, look at the news, look at the surrounding environment and go, I need to be a wise virgin and buy my oil now because God's going to use me in these times for the most remarkable harvest that the world has ever seen. Good news, ladies and gentlemen, good news. 1 Peter 5, 8 says to be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. That is why it is so important for us to come, become aware and intimate with the lion of the tribe of Judah's roar. Because the enemy knows that they, if God's people comprehend his roar, then the devil is in trouble. So the devil has to emulate a fake news story about what the lion's roar is. <laughs> ah, woman's right to chew. <laughs> ah, man-made climate change. Prejudice. The hates of different ethnic people. Ah, yeah. I'm going to give you some of these highlighted areas that I read to you in uh, Matthew 24. And I want you to be aware of how these things are timely now, even perhaps beyond your own imagination. I'm going to deal with not only scripture, but I'm going to deal with news stories and other news-related events that are going to open your eyes to be a wise virgin. The first one I want to talk about is Daniel's 70 weeks or the 70th week of Daniel. And I'm also going to talk to you about the peace treaty that is in progress right now Thank you to Donald Trump and his entourage. We're going to talk about the construction of the third temple. We're going to talk about tribulation and great tribulation. We're going to talk about the Antichrist and the false prophet. We're going to talk about the two witnesses that are being activa activated soon to a nation near you. We're going to talk about the largest harvest in the world ever and even the role that you may play in that. We're going to talk about devastating world war. We're going to talk about Armageddon and Christ's return. And we're going to do all this 
in about 45 minutes or so. So I guess you can see that I'm going to be blitzkrieging through. I'm going to be going very fast through this scripture. And take note, as I do, but I'm also going to put this into a video form and put it on YouTube so you'll be able to revisit these things as well. And, and Limitless Realms will have the ability to do that as well, so we'll talk further about that. Okay, are we ready, ready to rock and roll? I'll tell you what, it's not only somber, but it's also <sighs> exciting because we could be that generation that actually not only sees the Lord return, but will be activated and empowered as a result of it so that we can prepare the way of the Lord. Yeah. <sighs> Daniel's 70th week. I'm going to read to you now from the book of Daniel. Daniel and Revelation and Matthew 24. These uh, verses coincide with one another in many ways, and I'll be moving back and forth through them, so please bear with me as we do that, okay? Here we go. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. The Lord is sp spake to Daniel, and Daniel was scribing this as to the best of his ability, though it was thousands of years before this would happen. Daniel, 70 weeks will be determined upon your people and upon thy holy city from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build again Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks, by the way. And the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times, and after the 62 weeks, of those 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off and the people of the prince who is to come, not the good lion, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm a covenant, the bad guy shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring to an end the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations, he shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined and poured out on the desolate. You can see that there's some de definite unfortunate things going on there. And it's because of the false lion, the Antichrist, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Now, I'm not going to have a chance to do an exegesis completely on these things. I'm just going to brush past them, but take copious notes, pray, weigh and pray as we go on this thing. I'm giving you what Scripture says, and I'm giving you the, what do I want to say, the traditional prophetic interpretation of these things. This is not a, a CAS exclusive revelation on these things. These things are proclaimed by Bible teachers and Bible prophetic teachers throughout. In Daniel we said, we heard that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem and until Messiah the prince comes shall be seven weeks and 62, uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks, that's 69 weeks, okay? Don't worry about this. I, if you don't do math, I don't do math either, either but bear with me because I'll show this to you clearly. And the street shall be rebuilt again, and the wall even in troublous times. Now, the scripture that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as though a day, Psalm 90 and 2 Peter 3, 8. That clearly says that in God's frame of reference, he deals in units of time frequently. And to him, one day can be the same as a thousand years, and a thousand years as though it were a day. In Ezekiel, it's a similar unit of time versus another similar unit of time. And in Ezekiel, Ezekiel was told by God to bestow judgment upon Israel for their disobedience and Judah also for their disobedience, these things ultimately leading to their captivities. And Ezekiel was told to lay on one side for a certain length of time, one day for a year, and on the other side, uh, for, to, for the judgment of Judah, the one side was for uh, Israel, and the other side was for the two tribes of Judah, lay on the other side, and he gave them a number of days to lay, and each day represented a year. So when you see in God's 
mentality, he uses a unit of time to represent another unit of time. Same thing in the book of Daniel, where it talks about the seven year, the, 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 the weeks of, of Daniel. Each week is a seven year week. So you, you start multiplying these out and you start to see some amazing things. Now as I turn the slide, you will see this. But let me tell you what you're looking at there. We're looking at the bottom bar says that 69 weeks equals 483 years. And if you did an historic look on that, those 483 years do as scripture says from the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem to the Lord Jesus Christ coming was 69 weeks or 483 years. And there you have the 483 years or 69 weeks. Now we knew at the beginning of this Daniel prophecy, it talks about 70 weeks. So there's the 69. And if you look, there is an area here. It is known as the great parenthesis. The great parenthesis is ending, and the 70th week of the prophecy is about ready to launch out. <laughs> yes, we say yay, but you need to know what's tied to this as well, okay? Because this is time for us to be prepared because we want to be ready for what the Lord is doing to bring to pass the things that need to come to pass for him to return for his bride, with his bride, for a thousand years to rule and reign. This is a, the seven years that we, we're going to talk about that a little bit. That's seven years. You will see there's a division between one three and a half year period and one three and a half year period. We're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about the rapture and how different people have different perspectives on this. And I'm just going to lay it out to you what the different perspectives are. You decide uh, from your study where you think this is going to happen. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Remember I read from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. And then in approaching the 70th week, here's what happens. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. This post was posted Sunday, June 30th, 2019. Sunday, June 30th, 2019. See what I mean? These prophecies are in our face. This is a picture. I went to Jerusalem uh, a couple months ago, and Honorina Hyman, my friend, with a line with Zion, an Orthodox Jew, took me in, uh, in the city of David and then down at the base of the city of David where the sh sh uh, Shalom's uh, pool is, and that was the sacrificial pool at the at uh, the three times of the three main feasts. The Jews were called into Jerusalem to worship the Lord. They had to have a ceremonial washing, which happened at the pool of Sol Shalom, and they were supposed to then walk up to the Temple Mount. The Psalms, there's Psalms in the Scripture that are called the Psalms of Ascension, walking up. And where did they walk up? They walked up to the area that we are that have has been established uh, and written about on June 30th, 2019. When Honorina took me there, there is also an, a, a, a water, just a drainage d ditch built underneath. Exactly. Underneath, it, it was built underneath the road. So I, I walked a few paces on the actual road, and it's called the pilgrimage road. I walked a few paces on it, and then we went subterranean, and wa we walked underneath it. And we walked all the way up to where the Temple Mount was. And let's just say I walked about four or five steps, and I said, you know, I need to breathe a little bit here. And she goes, okay, well, we'll wait. And so we wait, you know, f you know in Scripture, the Bible talks about David bringing the ark back, and he walked six paces. I could identify with that. Daniel's 70th week is upon us. The street shall be built again. I want to talk a little bit about the peace treaty and the building of the third temple. I'm going to have to roar past this because I want to be very sensitive to your time. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, For when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon you as a woman in travail. 
I don't know who is following the news in Israel right now, but a peace treaty, two parts of a peace treaty are being presented to the Middle Eastern nations, particularly that are going to be tied to Palestine and Israel, but also the other surrounding Sunni-related nations like Jordan, like Egypt, like the United a Arab Emirates, and like Saudi Arabia because the Iranians are threatening war and the Iranians are not the Sunni people, they are the Shiite people which are more war-minded. And they don't care who's in their way, whether you're a Sunni who is kind of violating their understanding of the great caliphate. So they have to, you know, they want to take them out as well as they want to take Israel out. So, so as you can understand, there's an in, a situation in the Middle East right now that you have unusual compatriots working with one another. You know, it's like uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates and um, Jordan and uh, Egypt are going, we need to make allegiance with Israel. They've got pretty good weapons and they're pretty smart about warfare and they can help us protect us from the bombs that may fall from Iran. An unusual time. So a peace treaty has been presented. This has been since the very beginning of Trump's inauguration. He had it in his mind to do the deal of the century. And he said if he can do this in the peace plan in the Middle East, that will be the most remarkable accomplishment. Well, let me share with you that in June 25th and 26th of 2019, what did you say? Yes, 2019. Yes, this June, the first part of a two-part peace plan was presented to Jordan, to the United Arab Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, and to Egypt, and the Palestinians didn't show, and the, the Israelis purposely didn't show because they didn't want to cause any unnecessary turbulence. But this peace plan, and you can see Jared Kushner there doing this in Bahrain, which is another little country in the Middle East. And this peace first half of the peace plan was a $50 billion investment plan for the entire region with the bulk of the resources going to help Palestine. They're talking about um, the building of uh, waterways and, and desalinization plants, and they're talking about airports and water ports, and they're talking about doing things that m will make this entire region a resort area for everybody to benefit. And you can understand these Arab Sunni related nations, they're going, this is wonderful. This is wonderful, and we want to be the leverage to have Palestine say, yeah, we'll, okay, we'll do it. And he, this is the first time in history that you have all these Arab nations that are aligning <laughs> with Israel to say, come on, this needs to happen, because the first phase is dealing with prosperity. We know that there's a second phase, and uh, the Trump people say that they're going to be releasing it possibly after the elections. We don't know exactly. They're, they're cat and mouse about when they're going to release the second half. But this, the first half was a peace and prosperity mentality, and the second half will be political. There's where the big <laughs> will happen. In Daniel 9, it says, the he, the soon to be revealed Antichrist, will confirm a covenant. That's the peace treaty. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. What is one week? Seven years. He will confirm a peace treaty or a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, in the middle of that seven-year week, three and a half years, you saw the three and a half years I showed you up there. In the middle of that time, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Once again, I show this to you. And there are, is your seven-year period of time right there in what we call the close of the church 
age and the beginning of the kingdom age. Are you following me so far? I know there's a lot of information here, but I need to get past it quickly. And you need to be aware of these things in progress right now. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the popular rapture doctrines. There are three or four ways of looking at this. Some believers say we, they have an uh, amillennial mentality, which means forget about all these things that are prophesied. They were all symbolic. We're in the middle of the, we're in the millennium right now. We're ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years right now. That's a hard one to swallow, but that's one of the things. And they have a bunch of scripture that you could, if you took those scriptures by themselves, you go, oh, they're right. But each one of these doctrines, if you take the scriptures by themselves, you could go, oh, they're right. Study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. The second presentation or strategy or uh, declaration is what they call the pre-tribulation rapture. That means the church goes up right here before the seven years of difficult times. That means we escape. We escape it. The next doctrine is called mid-tribulation and many people and believe me there's scriptures for each one of these things the, the next posture is mid-tribulation which happens between the two three and a half year periods of time before it really gets bubbly bubbly and then we go up and there's a lot of scriptures that support this as well I used to believe in the first one then I started to believe in the second one the third one is called a post-trib or after the conclusion of the tribulation, the church is taken up to be with the Lord and they come back to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I want to give you just an overlaying scripture that deals with each one of these things. You're going to have to study these things out and come to your own comfort zone. But let me give you my thought because in we found out about these things in Matthew 24. Now, in Matthew 25, Jesus says this, and there's no chapter divisions in the scripture like we put there. So this very likely happened at the same time frame that Jesus was talking about these things in Matthew 24 that I read to you. In Matthew 25, it talks about the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish virgins. The five wise virgins bought extra oil, because they were concerned that the Lord would delay his coming. And the five foolish virgins said, eh, we got it. And the Lord delayed his coming, and the ones who bought the extra oil had the light and the awareness of what was going to happen, and they handled it properly. And the five foolish virgins say, please, please sell us of your oil. No, go buy it yourself. We're in the last of the last of the last. You needed to buy your oil when it was readily available. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus shared this verse as part of the Olivet, Olivet Discourse, likely, and that would suggest that he's saying, you, no one knows the day or the hour exactly, but you better be ready. And if he, de if he delays, let me, let me just say, if you're a person that goes, we're going to be taken out before any of this happens, no problem. Okay, but what happens if you're not? Have you put everything, all those eggs in that basket? And what happens if that doesn't happen exactly that way? Are you prepared or not? I'm not going to say any more about that. Now I want to talk a little bit about the third temple. While the scripture does not say specifically there will be built a third temple, but there are prophetic representations that suggest how can these things happen without a third temple being in place. The Bible says that you will see in uh, Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads this, let him understand. If he's standing in the holy place and there's no temple, he's not standing in the holy place. So something has to happen in that first three-year period, three-and-a-half-year period of time that will promote the building of the third temple. I was in Israel. Many, uh, many of you have been in Israel. You know on the top of the Orthodox Jewish mind and many other people as well is that there is the, the preparations for all of the elements of the third temple are in place already. They're just looking for the property. P 
peace treaty will very likely include a shared use of the Temple Mount and not destroy the Alaska Mosque or the Dome of the Rock, which are already there. And I'm just going to throw this out to you because this puts this scripture that I didn't really fully understand into true perspective. In the book of Revelation, he says to the angel, uh, d d d to, to the angel, measure the temple. Measure the temple, but leave out the outer court because that is given over to the Gentiles. Some prophetic observers, and I am tending to agree with this, say they couldn't, they had to leave out the outer court because it's given over to the Gentiles, meaning the, the uh, Muslims, because you've got the Alaska Mosque and you've got the Dome of the Rock there, so you can put the temple up, the holy place in the Holy of Holies, but you can't do the outer court because that infringes upon the Muslim turf. I went, man, I've been reading that. What does that mean? They go, well, that could very likely be what it means. Whoa! The Jerusalem Post, March 26, 2018, last year. Animal sacrifices have begun to be practiced by the, by the priests. Let me read to you just very briefly about this story. I'm going to have to increase it so I can read it too. But it says, uh, activists carry out the Passover sacrifice ritual at the foot of the Temple Mount. Hundreds of activists and supporters attended the annual exercise of Passover sacrifice that was conducted for the first time uh, next to the southern wall at the foot of the Temple Mount. And the ceremony was on that Monday and included the slaughtering of two lambs and a demonstration of the work of the Kohanan or the Kohathites or the priests. Let me tell you what happened as a result. Well, first of all, let me give you a quote of the one of the guys who's the head of that, the spokesman for the Temple Mount activist movement. He said he was thrilled with the event, adding that when 10,000 people will attend, we'll actually do it on the Temple Mount itself. I saw this in the news as I was looking through the news of that happening. They actually slaughtered the lambs to illustrate what it was going to be like. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like the killing of animals. In fact, all of Europe has a rule that you have to stun them first before you can butcher them and eat them. But the Jews, the, the priests say, no, that's, that, that's causing imperfection in the sacrifice. It's, 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 I, what, there's a word for it, uh, making the sacrifice null and void and unusable, basically. And, and so can you, let, let's just put this in, in the context of the last days. The animal sacrifices begin again. The raucous disagreement from all the green peacers and those who say, eat plants. I, I'm not, not, it's okay if you're a vegetarian. I'm not, I'm not saying anything against that. But I'm just saying the tumult that's going to happen as a result of this, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, Good guys, bad guys. Good guys, those who are keep keeping the animals from being injured. Bad guys, those who are doing the sacrifice. And so he, you're, you're seeing the lines happening, the division happening. I'm going to talk a little bit about this division again in another area, but it's going to amaze you, the things that the enemy has already seeded in the world. We talked a little bit about the third temple. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time about the tribulation and the great tribulation. Uh, you saw the division between the three and a half years and three and a half years. <coughs> I will suggest to you that they're both tribulation, but the second half is the great tribulation. You heard me read that, that there's been nothing like that or ever will be. And unless those days are shortened, it could fool even God's elect. This is a somber time, and you can understand my apprehension with sharing this, but you can all under, uh, also understand if this is so and these things are coming to pass sooner than we think, somebody has to say, beware. And if they don't happen within this immediate time frame, that's great. You can put it on a shelf and you say, you know, Kaz was speaking out of turn. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. But if this is so, somebody has to forewarn God's people. And I'm not saying it's all on me. There are people that are ministering these things throughout the earth now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with that, but you have to weigh and pray on this. And my listening friend, if you're watching this thing on YouTube or wherever it's being broadcast, somber times. 
we as a believers need to be aware of the things that are coming to pass, and we need to stand vigilantly for God's stuff. A little bit about the tribulation times. The Bible says in Matthew 24, you heard me read it, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, for then there will be great tribulation. My company and I worked with generation to generation to do a documentary called uh, Quest for Truth, the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And during that time, we came across this map as we were interviewing people in the Holy Land. Let me share with you this map. This, remember the scripture, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Why would those in Judea flee to the mountains? You will see this area, the white area there is called the West Bank or also known as Judea. The scriptural reference to Ju Judea is the West Bank area. This West Bank area is a right now a shared community where you have settlements of Israel, the black dots, and you have Palestinian communities, the gray dots, and they're sharing the turf. You can see that it would be very difficult to get the Jews out of there. In fact, the people that are living there say, we're not leaving, this is our land. This is their settlements. So when the scripture says, let those who are in Judea flee, why would they flee if they were protected by Israel? The supposition there is if they are not protected by Israel, th that if they are under the Palestinian government's authority, then uh, Israel will not be able to go in and protect them like they should. So as things get bubbling and the Jews are being persecuted and even put to death, those in Judea will be the first to, to hit because they are vulnerable. So that's why I believe the scripture says, let those who are in Judea flee. Don't even go into your house. Don't even collect anything else. Go to the mountains and hide out. That's why there's a danger in a two-state solution because if the two-state solution includes Palestine having this area of the West Bank as their state, then any of the Jews that stay there must be under Palestinian dominion. Now, let me get back to the month of Av briefly for you here because this ties in. My friend Anarina Hyman, which is a, who is a Bible student, an Orthodox Jew, here's what she said. We were willing back in 2005, August, to offer peace on a political level to give up some of our own most fertile ground in order for the peace process to move forward. They gave up Gaza. That happened on the 9th of Av. As soon as they did that, rockets started coming from Gaza, launched by Hamas, which is the, the terror, one of the terrorist uh, cells uh, that are tied with Iran and Iraq and that area. The 9th of Av. Other things that happened in the 9th of Av that dealt with the expulsion of the Jews in 1290 from England, there was a decree that said, no Jews here, you're gone. Now listen to this. In Spain, in 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He sailed from Spain. Many historians now believe that Columbus was a Jew. <laughs> and there were two different categories of Jews. There were those who just proclaimed Catholicism, and they kind of meant it, and they were protected, but there were also those who said, well, sure we will, sure we will, but they kept the feast, they kept the Jewish traditions. Those people were identified, and uh, many of the historians feel that Christopher Columbus was among them. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but you see how this works? In the whole progression of time in history, the ninth of Av, Av, and the judgments and things like that have been going on cyclically for us to get the lesson for NOW now. I'm going to try to hurry through this. We dealt with the tribulation, great uh, tribulation, and Antichrist and false prophets. Uh, now, I need to share with you, those of you who are, who are squeamish about the different Christian religions need to be aware of this. You may want to put this on a shelf. For false Christs, the Antichrist, and false prophets, false prophets, including the 
main false prophet himself, will rise and show great signs and wonders, if possible, deceive even the very elect. The, here you see the false Christ and you see the false prophets. There are two different aspects here. The false Christ represents the government, and the false prophets represent religion. And when you have government and religion fighting against the church, the church is overwhelmed. As I say, this is delicate, and I want to be very sensitive to my Catholic friends. Listen to me closely. There are many, 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 in fact, every, all the Catholics that I know embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, no question about it. Many of them are not aware of what is happening behind the scenes with Pope Francis. In February 2019, did you say 2019? Yes, I said 2019. February this year, the Roman Catholic Pope met with the chief imam of the Sunni. And they declared peace and tranquility among all religions. Let me read to you an article that was published in February of 2019. You understand what I'm saying? This is in our face. It's in our face. Pope Francis and the leading imam signed a covenant pushing one world religion. The signing of the covenant was done in front of the global audience of religious leaders from Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and the other, other faiths. Over and over again, the word God was used to simultaneously identify Allah with the God of Christianity. The document also boldly declared that the diversity of religions um, that we see in the world, it has been willed by God. Beware, my friends. Beware. This happened in February. How many of you knew that this had happened? Some, some here. Cause for awareness and alarm. Buy your oil now. We talked about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now I'm going to spend a little bit, very briefly, about the two witnesses. The two witnesses will be activated. And while you have the false prophet and the false Christ or the Antichrist, that gruesome, twosome, doing evil things, to offset that, God raises up his two witnesses. These are individuals are activated to counterbalance the evil that is in, in the process of coming to pass, proclaiming Jesus Christ and the Jewish heritage, standing firmly on those things so that many people can have an opportunity to believe. And I think this is probably going to be one of the genesis, if you will, for the great harvest. People are going to come to the Lord left, right, up, and down as a result of this. Now, now the, I'm going to posture this question to you. Would it be appropriate for God to have his saints handy to help illustrate this salvation to unbelieving nations to unbelieving nations now how many of you have prayed Lord whatever whatever you want me to do I will do what happens if he says he's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance well, I want to put you in a position where you can be responsible for the salvation of, s of people beyond your imagination I want you to be prepared for the church being the, the, church, the church is being overwhelmed with people that say, I want God, the true God, not the false God. Can you imagine the harvest that will take place? Just a thought. We talked a little bit about the two witnesses. If you want to find out more about this, I did a teaching right, I'm probably standing in this very spot, a while look back, if you want to find out more about what those two witnesses are, those two witnesses, as with the false prophet and the false Christ, they will have companies with them. People that tag along and say they're right and they will espouse those truths or falsities that the others have espoused. The, the governmental people and the religious people on both sides. And the two uh, evil witnesses, the Antichrist and the false prophet, will have entourages following them and saying, these guys are right, and any time that anything else happens that's adverse to that, they go, those guys are evil. So the two witnesses will have companies. If you want to find out a little bit more about that, I invite you to go to YouTube, put Kaz Taylor and two witnesses, and you'll be able to hear that teaching that was done right here. But let me here, here's what I'm talking about. The, the, the enemy has set the stage for this. Man made climate change 
when the two witnesses start proclaiming things and lightning and thunder and earthquakes and things like that happen at their de declaration, you can see what people might say, ah, oh, see, man-made climate change. Anybody who embraces this must be hateful to mankind. And r right now the vitriol of those who believe that man-made climate change is, you know, do, do the math as you do the studies on it. There is climate change, no question about it, but we little meager human beings changing God's pattern for climate. Mm. You do the math on this and do the study. You will discover that much of this man-made climate change theory doesn't wash. But you do the math yourself. But I'm just saying, can you imagine if this happens, especially those who say the climate change thing, the man-made climate change thing. See? Anybody who's proclaiming Christ and godliness, see what's happening here? They have to go. Can you imagine the animus that's happeni happening in the earth in those days where believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, for different reasons, it can be the abortion issue, it can be um, man-made climate change, it can be any one of a number of different things, that the, or how about globalism versus nationalism? You know, we were believe in a one-world government. Oh, yeah, well we believe that the, the, that the individual nations should be sanctified, they should have their own rule and reign. Oh no, you're evil. Can you, this is where we're going right now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm just telling you, you weigh and pray that. Now we talked a little bit about the two witnesses, and I want to share with you, as I wind this down, the largest worldwide harvest coming soon. Sometimes in the book of Revelation and these other books, they have symbols that are valid symbols. Other times, we take these things as symbols, but they are real activities that come to pass. There is a reference in uh, Daniel and in Revelation about beasts, B-E-A-S-T-S, coming into play. There is, as you will read in Daniel and also in the book of Revelation, you will read of a lion, you will read of an eagle, a bear, a leopard, and a terrible, dreadful beast with ten horns. And I'm not going to go into great detail there, but this is symbolism identifying different nations. England, most commonly identified as the lion. The United States, most commonly identified as the eagle. The bear, most commonly identified as the Soviet Union. The leopard has had two different symbols. One is a is a uh, uh, an eagle, the black eagle, which was the symbol of Nazism. And you can believe that a lot of people will say, you know, that the eagle's wings represent Nazism. But the truth of the matter is the eagle's wings, I believe, is the United States. And let me tell you, I'll show you why. But then, th then you have the dreadful beasts as well. So you have these different animals in the last days symbolized. The beast, many believe, is the... European Union with ten, the ten, the ten different, uh, the ten different allies together in in this in this ten world union. Not long ago, a matter of a year or so ago, I think the ten nation union came to pass. The tenth one was added. I'm not going to go into great depth there, but listen to this because we Americans. If we're pursuing God and godliness, let me share with you what happens to those eagle's wings because the eagle's wings, the scripture says, the four great beasts came up out of the sea to verse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings and I beheld until the eagle's wings thereof were plucked out and lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon their feet as a man and a man's heart was given unto it. These eagle wings were taken out of what was, they were in they were embedded in the lion and then they were take taken out of the lion and made to stand as a man stands with a man's heart. What if happens if that's the United States? Does that make sense? Wh wh what happened when England, England was the ruler in the United States of America and then you had the great warfare happening and they were divorced from uh, ex extricated from the United States and America was America and the eagle was the eagle. Let me share with you something. In Revelation 12, Revelation 12, we discover that 
what happens of those with those wings that were plucked out. The Bible says in Revelation 12, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head were 12 stars. She, being with child, cried in travail in, in birth, and she was pain, in pain to be delivered. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she may be nourished for time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. So what happens if those e the illustration of the eagle is the United States of America who comes alongside of Israel and protects her? Is that possible? Are we looking at what's going on in politics these days? Are we looking at what's happening on the government, the present government of the United States standing beside Israel, available to protect Israel. And perhaps that is why the Islams say little Satan, Israel, big Satan, the United States. Are you getting my drift here? And once again, and I'm not going to spend much time because we're running down, but there, but there, there's the reference right there to that for time, times, and half a time. I think that was in the Great Tribulation time. American, the um, America comes alongside of Israel, protects her, and God says he carried. The Scripture says he, she's carried away into a wilderness of protection. Don't know exactly what that is. I have some suppositions, but protected. God is looking out for Israel. God is looking out for. Christians because he plans to have one new man Jew and Gentile and that cannot happen without that intimate relationship between the two now I'm just going to spend a moment on this because this is really winding down the devastation and, and world war listen to this in the scripture says that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and you look into um, Revelation I'm going to go there right now with you because uh, Things that are going on in the waterways in in, in Israel in, in the Israel area, Iran area, and so forth are happening now. I'm going to share this with you because it's going to blow your mind. You're going to appreciate the prophetic word from one of our dear friends whom you may know. In Revelation 9, 13 through 16, it says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, Remember that in the great river Euphrates, which w are prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year for to slay one-third of mankind. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousands. That's a, an army of 200 million soldiers. And I heard the number of them. <sighs> Take a big gulp. How many have heard about the Strait of Hamuz recently? The Strait of Hamuz. There are oil tankers that have been confiscated or attacked by the Iranians. Even right now, I think they're still being held hostage, those of an, a British oil tanker in the Strait of Hamuz. Let me share with you the geography here. I'm going to go to the left first and increase the size a little bit. You will see four nations. You will see, see the river Euphrates there? It's, it's a, that blue area, that's the river Euphrates. And if you look, you will see the Euphrates runs through Turkey, a Shiite nation. It runs through Syria, a Shiite nation. It runs through Iraq, which is a Shiite nation. And it runs through a little tip down there of Iran as well. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Is it possible that those have the characteristics of those who want to destroy Israel and the United States? Those four nations th where in the Euphrates River flows. Things are happening there. But let me share with you what this looks like from a news article that was published on 7-26-19. What do you mean? July 26th, 2019. When was that? Days ago from when this presentation 
is being delivered. This was Fox News, and the declaration was that um, the missiles, Iranian missiles, were being tested where this, this place, you see that little skinny place right there where the water goes? That's the Strait of Hamuz. That is the Strait of Hamuz. And it's a narrow place where, you know, the, the oil vessels have to go through there. And Iran says, you're infringing upon our turf. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, yes, you are. Then, and Iran s sends their boats and l targets their missiles for that area. And President Trump the, the, the U.S. drone was shot down not long ago, a few weeks ago. And President Trump was thinking about giving the order to destroy the area from which where the rockets fell, uh, were, were, were launched. And he got an assessment for casualties. And he, he, the assessment was it was going to probably be at least 120 people killed. And he said, I'm not going to do this because it was just a drone. I'm not going to do this. So he stayed that decision. He could have said, do it, and that could have launched a war, but that's how close we are. And what's, gonna, what's Britain going to do with their people there? And this and this and this is a something that happened on the 26th of July. Uh, I, Iran fired from that area there, which is the Persian Gulf area. Fired a missile, a test, just a test missile. Didn't have any warheads on it, but it, they fired it to, and a, 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 and it was successful. It traveled 620 miles and fell into the desert. No harm, but that was the test. Imagine what happens. They go, okay, 620 miles. If I draw 620 miles from where I launched this thing, that's going to hit Israel. It's going to hit many of the Shiite Arab nations as well. He, they're testing this thing, and uh, you know when is when is a, an actual nuclear warhead going to be attached to these things. They know the distance. Now I'm going to read something as I begin to close here about the dangers and the powers of waterways. This is a quote. I'm going to read this to you. Our western border is the Pacific Ocean. By the way, the, the area that I showed you with the Strait of Hamuz and all these things emptying out into the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean is there and right beside the Indian Ocean is the Pacific Ocean. That's our ocean on the West Coast. That's our ocean. Now let me read to you this quote. Our western border uh, is the Pacific Ocean and the five oceans of Earth are interconnected to it so that we can be impacted uh, and we can impact other nations and their waterways. Uh, this is true not only concerning physical things like trade but also spiritual things too. The water, marine, spirit kingdom a sub subsidiary of the kingdom of darkness is actively working and engaged in the region and in the nation. On many occasions, Satan has used the power of water spirits to challenge the purposes of God on earth. The attacks of these spirits can manifest as confusion, poor decisions, because we don't see or hear rightly, twisting of words, hopelessness, weariness, lack of passion to pray or spend time with the Lord, seduction, deception, pride, and a lot of things that are working on the mind with adverse reasoning, negativity, anxiety, and even a fear that can trigger aggressive action. This is a quote from a lady named Billy Alexander. She probably delivered it in... This, this is with the prayer group. Many of you here are involved in that. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and uh, many of us spent time um, at the lighthouse recently where we're praying over the oceans and the waterways and things like that. Ladies and gentlemen, th there are people that are hearing the Lord and they're declaring pieces of this puzzle. Pay close attention, pay close attention, pay close attention. I've shared with you these things. I'm going to share with you the good part now talking about Armageddon and the time of Christ returns. The Olivet, Olivet Discourse talks about Armageddon and, and, and seven trumpets, the se our angel of the seventh trumpet, and it says, when he shall begin to sound the seventh trumpet, it says, the mystery of God shall be finished. As such, Christ returns with ten thousands of his saints to rule and reign for a thousand years. We win. Scripture says in Ma uh, Matthew 24, and immediately after the tribulation, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give us light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And, that's the Armageddon, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, not the godly tribes, the tribes of the earth 
not the tribes of God. They will mourn, and all the tribes will mourn and see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with great sound of the trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Daniel 7. Talking about the horn, the enemy, the horn, it says, was prevailing against the saints, the godly people. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor. Gavel, please. (laughs) And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints were to possess the kingdom. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people the saints of the Most High, His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. It's great news. Now, when you raised your hands earlier, I'm not sure you were able to contemplate the the things that happened between here and there. And you probably didn't contemplate that it, it could be as few as weeks, months, years for this to begin, or it could be years and years and years. I just gave you some circumstantial evidence on each one of the prophetic counts here. Weigh and pray. But above all, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, buy oil for the most remarkable harvest that the world has ever seen. (laughs) 